we're just hoping to sort of do an overview and um, have a little Q and A. And um, we really appreciate the opportunity to participate in this study. It's obviously there's a lot of work that's been into it. And we have some of our key decision makers uh, here today. Um, and we're starting to think about our budget for, for 2023. So we're hoping to just uh, view some of the highlights of the study and um, we'll let you guys pretty much lead the conversation. But uh, Dan, Ken, Mike, Tim, do you have any other things you wanna to add to what I just said? Okay, well, well, well let's start the call like this then. Um, uh, I don't know everyone on the phone, so if we could do quick introductions. Um, did you guys already do that? No? no. Okay, good. Um, well, I'll start then. So I'm Steve Harris. I am the Consumers Energy Power My Fleet lead. Um, we were the uh, people who enrolled you guys into our Power My Fleet program to help you uh, electrify your vehicles. So for today's call, we are looking at your assessment, um, giving you guys more up to date where to start, uh, what you would look to to electrify your vehicles. Um, that's why we have Justin on the call. He is the consultant that dug into the weeds for you guys and really provided all of that data. For today's cause follow up um, with your next steps, feel free to ask as many questions as you would like. We want this information to make a lot of sense to you. At the same time, we want this information to be easy for you to understand um, once you're, you know, in your own silos again, and everybody has a chance to look at the assessments individually, you may have different thoughts and things that come along um, throughout your process. So I'll pass it over to Justin that he can introduce himself. Great, thanks, Steve. Yep, uh, so my name is Justin Eichenberger. I acted kind of as the account manager uh, throughout this process here, um, essentially guiding you through this process, generating the results of this report. Um, and then along with Jonathan Siegel, I can let him uh, introduce himself as well. Yeah, hi all, nice to see you all again. Uh, my name is Jonathan Siegel. I'm the energy analyst uh, who has done most of the backend analysis of this assessment. Um, so looking forward to hearing your feedback, any questions, and I'm happy to uh, walk through some of the highlights of the assessment as well. Okay, why don't we go with Dan, Tim, uh, Mike, and then Ken. Hey, uh, Dan Opsmer, Assistant Township Manager and Director of Public Works and Engineering. Schmidt, I'm the Community Planning and Development Director for the Township. Mike? Uh, Mike Hamill, Fire Chief. Ken Plaga, Police Chief. <clears throat> and uh, Rob and Brian? Rob McKenzie, DPW Superintendent in charge of the motor pool. Brian Shorky, I'm the senior planner. Sorry, we ran late. Uh, had a, someone at the counter I had to take care of. And I'm Leroy Harvey, um, environmental programs manager. Um, Derek Perry, who you presented to a few months ago, um, has moved on to another community. So hence, we're sort of um, revisiting this a bit. Melissa, we're just doing quick introductions and um, we're going to proceed from there. Go ahead. Well, what am I supposed to say? Just who you are, basically. Uh, Melissa, the Director of Project Management and Operations. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, you guys can take it. Did I miss anybody? I don't think so. so. You guys can take it away, uh, Jonathan or Justin. Justin, does it make sense for me to just touch on some of the highlights now? Yeah, I think so, if you don't mind bringing up the report there. Hey, real quick before we get started, so I just want to validate. So. With the person who transitioned forward, everyone on this call has never seen this assessment at all, correct? I've read uh, it in some de detail. Oh, okay, okay. I just was curious of who's seen it, who didn't see it. Um, that helps out a lot with the uh, level of questions that, you know, feel free, you can ask or answer. So that helps ICF. So then when they do give you a high review of it, they know where to start um, and, and who's seen it, who hasn't seen it, and, and what is going to be the most important pieces of it. The goal for today, though, is that we're trying to make it easy for you guys to say this would be step one for us to electrify our fleet because the assessment itself is very detailed. It can be confusing. Sometimes when you're looking at it by yourself, you'll see rebate items and different things like that. And um, ICF does a really, really good job in their presentation and how they lay things out. So we just want you to see that today. Um, and they'll, like I said, they're here to, uh, as, a, as, a, as a consultant to answer any questions you have that are in the assessment or things that you may think about in the future, um, such like Tim, he's read through a lot of it. So he may have some questions about things that we didn't address in the assessment. 
And the only thing I would add to that is if you just give us a broad sweep of ICF's um, market penetration, like how many other communities do you work with? Um, and then go ahead and get started, Jonathan. Thank you, Stephen. Sure. Well, Justin, I'll let you give a little ICF introduction. You've probably gotten that down more than I do. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so yeah, we're ICFs. So we're a pretty large consulting firm here, more than 6,000 full and part-time employees. Specifically, Jonathan, I, and the rest of our team here, we work in the electrification sector, uh, contracted with multiple utilities throughout the country, essentially, putting on these fleet electrification programs. Uh, so with consumers, we're working with 20 to 30 other uh, fleets um, here in Michigan um, to put, up, put forth these programs. We're also working with a bunch of organizations, uh, mainly public in Massachusetts, public organizations, and then both commercial and public fleets around the rest of the country. So we have a pretty good understanding of what goes on in the rest of the country, as well as just Michigan here. But um, you know, specifically, this report here is focused in on Michigan, which Jonathan will run through. Great, cool. So, um, yeah, just to, to run it back, recap for a second, um, you know, we, we met to discuss your data. Uh, that was the first time that I was pulled into the call and we, we ran through uh, your fleet, both on road and off road. Um, and then the next time we met, I delivered the initial results and, you know, requested feedback from your team. Um, and then adjustments were made uh, to the final report based on your feedback. Um, so, the report that you have in hand now is gonna be slightly different than the presentation that was originally given. And so today to, to make sure that we're reflecting the um, actual final report results, we're gonna just take a look at the report uh, rather than at that presentation that we reviewed originally. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen here, which is a PDF of the report. So it should look familiar to you all. Uh, I'll run through some of the, the key takeaways, um, a couple of the key assumptions, and you guys can feel free to stop me along the way at any point, ask any questions, uh, or there'll be plenty of time at the end for questions as well. All right, let's see here. It's been a while since I've used Zoom, so let's see. Here we go. That should work. You all see the PDF here? All right. Great. Okay, so this is the, the uh, title page, and then we'll jump into the executive summary here, uh, which, you know, the most important part to look at here is going to be the uh, recommended EV replacement timeline, um, where uh, you'll see that we're recommending replacements towards 2031, uh, starting in 2022. Um, we've got 75 on-road vehicles. Uh, and so the dark blue is your internal combustion engine vehicles that you currently have tapering away. The gray is your internal combustion engine replacements that we don't recommend electric for. And then the blue that's increasing towards the right is gonna be your uh, electric vehicle replacements. Uh, so this first page should just give you a, a nice overview of everything that's going on in terms of schedule, uh, number of vehicles, uh, and the total cost of ownership highlights, which uh, I'll jump over towards now here. Um, so this, this is the next part of the executive summary page. So you'll see that um, our analysis has found that um, over 24 years, which is that first 10 years of replacement and then uh, 15 years of the lifespan added on to that of all of the replacement vehicles, the 24 years total, total cost of ownership savings would be over $718,000. Um, that is made up of multiple parts. It's partially fuel cost savings. It's partially maintenance savings. Uh, and not listed here, it's also capital costs. Um, so, you know, they're not necessarily going to add up to each other. Fuel plus maintenance savings does not equal total cost of ownership savings. We're also looking at capital costs and uh, rebates incentives that are built into that total cost of ownership calculation. And so we're also estimating a little over 3,500 metric tons of CO2 eliminated over those 24 years. Again, the lifespan of the whole vehicle, uh, of all the vehicles. And then on the right side, you'll see some equivalencies, um, you know, a little over 3,500 and 3,567 metric tons of CO2 is also equivalent to uh, these items on the side, eliminating 410 homes and so on. Um, that kind of content, we recommend, you know, sharing with your external stakeholders, trying to include it in any media where this might be picked up in. Uh, it's a good tangible way to understand the impacts. 
So moving on in the report, um, it's going to go over you know a breakdown of your fleet, starting with how many vehicles were in the fleet, uh, how many are active on-road vehicles that are part of our core assessment, uh, and then how many actually have electric vehicle equivalents, and finally what we're recommending uh, for conversion. And then it'll go on to your existing fleet makeup. So this is just um, you know illustrating what your fleet looks like to us in terms of vehicle types and in terms of fuel types. And then the next page is the existing retirement schedule. I believe for Meridian, uh, your fleet did have some retirements that were sort of in the past that were you're trying to catch up on. So that's one of the reasons why 2022 retirements are so high uh, because there were 2020, 2021, and 2022 built up in that first initial year of retirements. So you'll see it broken down here by vehicle type. And then we'll also make sure to list any vehicle types that were excluded from the analysis at the bottom here. Uh, so non-road equipment, ambulances and fire trucks, unfortunately don't have electric vehicle equivalents at the time. So we are excluding those, excuse me one second. And then, so the next section is gonna review key assumptions and, and I'll just touch on a couple here right now, um, not to take everyone's time too long here, but um, you know, fuel costs, that's something that's, um, you know, on everyone's mind right now. Uh, fuel costs have been rising since this, this assessment was completed. So, you know, that's worth considering. Um, your fuel costs were provided to us. So we used your actual uh, fuel costs for, I think it was a two month average that we used to create an annual average. Um, and then we also calculated um, future costs based on the Energy Information Administration's data. Um, so, you know, keep in mind that that fuel costs for internal combustion engines have risen. They haven't risen quite as much as you may think because we're still trying not to get too extreme in terms of our projections in the future. Um, yes, right now they are, you know, one and a half, two times what they were when your assessment was completed. Uh, but in terms of our five year projections, um, they're about 15 to 20 percent higher right now. Uh, as a starting spot. So we, you know, if we were to do it again today, we'd probably put you somewhere around the $2.80 uh, to $3 a gallon uh, of fuel costs, rather of gasoline costs, rather than $2.62. So keep that in mind. Again, that's something to consider going forward. That costs have risen a bit, but we expect them not to continue to rise too much further. And then this will also just highlight, you know, what we used to calculate maintenance costs, electricity costs, which used uh, consumers energy, uh, general, sec uh, excuse me, general service secondary time of use rates. Uh, be happy to dive in and Steve may be able to elaborate a little bit on what, you know, time of use rates are, but essentially, you know, we're looking to, uh, and consumers energy is looking to encourage you to charge your vehicles during the off hours when rates are lower and when the impact on the grid is more beneficial for everyone. Um, so that will give you a better rate. It'll give consumers a more stable load. Uh, and overall, it'll, it'll save more money in the end. Yeah, Jonathan, you're absolutely correct on that. I couldn't have stated it better. Um, the general time of uh, time of use rate, which is a secondary rate, we have one secondary and we have one primary. But what it does, it just allows you to save a lot more money on the rate. There's different ranges in the rate. There's a low peak, a mid peak, and an off peak. Um, and a lot of times we're assuming that a lot of customers are going to be using that off peak time period to charge their vehicles. But um, we do know that some customers may charge during the day if the vehicle is not being driven as well. And that just gives you the best option um, for a charger and, a, and an EV vehicle. So um, those are also in our electric tariff. If you're curious about that in more detail, I can get that information to you. Awesome. Thanks, Steve. And yeah, just to elaborate that on a little further, um, we did assume that your vehicles have six hours to charge overnight. And that's what all of our uh, charger recommendations are based off of, whether it was level two or DC fast, um, and using that, that secondary time of use rate as well. Of course, it does get cold in Michigan. So we considered that in the vehicle range estimates as well. Uh, so we are uh, derating the range by 20% to assume that vehicles have 80% of their maximum range based on the average temperature um, for Michigan. So, you know, just consider that, that we are 
and we are incorporating uh, temperature estimates in, in our recommendations. Sorry about the coughing, just uh, actually recovering from COVID here myself. Um, here is a uh, total cost of ownership <clears throat> annual comparison. Again, you know, 2022 does look a little bit heavier than the rest of the years. That's, uh, you know, because of those older retirements that we're catching up on. Uh, but you'll see here that um, the total cost of ownership of the recommended electric vehicles is lower than the uh, internal combustion engine replacement total cost of ownership almost every year, uh, except for 2029. We must have, must have a big capital cost in there. Um, so, you know, annually they're lower and then moving on to cumulative, cumulatively they are lower as well. Uh, and it looks like we, uh, we do have our first break even uh, earlier. It looks like around 2024, 2025, but then that capital cost later in 29 will push uh, the true break even more towards that 2029, 2030. Let me just peek if we actually listed it here. Yeah, we are listing break even as 2023. But that um, that advantage on the EV side will expand uh, as capital costs are in the past and as fuel and maintenance costs are incurred. The more you drive your vehicles, the more you're going to save money with electric vehicles because they're so much more affordable in terms of fuel and maintenance. All right, so this section here is going to be our actual one to one recommendations. This is just a high level summary. Um, there's also a detailed version of this that we supplied to you as part of a Excel supplement file. I also have that available for us to review today if we'd like. Um, so you'll see the vehicle type listed on the left, quantity up for retirement, and then ultimately the quantity that we recommend to convert to electric in that third column. And then the recommended make and model is based on the lowest total cost of ownership vehicle. So, Nissan Leafs, Mazda's MX-30, Chevy Bolt, these are the lowest total cost of ownership light duty vehicles that we have in our electric vehicle library. It doesn't necessarily mean it's the right option for your fleet. And we understand that there are some nuances between these low cost electric vehicles. And so we uh, will touch on it in a moment, but there's a, a model comparison section towards the end where you can compare the total cost of ownership uh, across other options. Uh, because again, we understand this lowest total cost might not be the perfect option for your fleet. But then moving on, we do quantify financial savings, again, across the life of all of the replacements and greenhouse gas emissions. And we're recommending a one-to-one -one charger recommendation as well. So for every uh, charger or for every EV, we will recommend a charger. And again, that charging, charging recommendation is, is made based on the range that the vehicle needs to travel every day and the time that's available to charge as well as cost cost is another factor as well we're, you know we're only recommending um cost effective electric vehicles here so if you know if a vehicle requires a dc fast charger and that ultimately makes it ineffective uh, or i'm sorry not cost effective then we won't uh, we won't recommend that vehicle so here's our actual recommended replacement timeline, uh, which does look slightly different than the existing timeline because we're not recommending all of your vehicles for replacement, but we're still seeing a little bit um, of a, uh, you know, upfront. Um, it, it's there's a lot of vehicles uh, in the first year here, uh, and then you know here I'm just noticing that that the heavy truck uh, there's one heavy truck it looks like that's recommended to electrify in 2029, which is likely why that capital cost bump. Uh, is occurring in our estimates in 2029 because heavy trucks are very expensive um, but there are a lot of great rebates available for them right now so we'll get to that in just a moment so this middle section of the report is going to highlight lots of details about charging uh, what assumptions went in to our analysis uh, and then we did do a site impact study so we have uh, you know four sites here and we're showing you what we recommend in terms of the level two or the DC fast chargers that are at each site. This is broken out in more detail in that supplemental file that we provided you, uh, but this will give you, you know, a high level overview. And what this is most useful for is uh, to coordinate with Steve and everyone at consumers and to make sure that you have the correct amount of power available at each site based on the estimated total power demand. 
And so these kilowatt estimates are going to be, uh, you know, at any given point in time. So if you were to have all 10 vehicles plugged in at 5151 Marsh, it would be pulling 20 kilowatts from the grid. This next part is the electric rate analysis, which we touched on earlier in the assumptions a little bit. So we compare the different rates, the general service secondary rate, and then the general service secondary time of use rate, which you can see is approximately 10%, maybe 12% lower than uh, the general rate. And then comparing it to internal combustion fuel costs, again, this difference is going to be about 15 to 20% more now because of the increase in fuel costs. Uh, so that 67,090, that's a little outdated. It, it'll be a bit higher. Um, to be honest, uh, you know, energy costs in general are increasing, but but the internal combustion energy costs are increasing significantly more than the rest. And then again, a comparison of the three rates, general service secondary rate, and then the time of use rate, and the light blue and the gray is internal combustion engine. So this is over the life of the vehicle, cumulative fuel costs. And then moving on, the next section here is going to be the incentive and funding sources that were applied in the analysis. Um, so we'll start with the program on the left. These are clickable links, so you can open them up and jump into the program website. And then we're showing you, you know, which vehicle types these are applicable for. Um, you know, medium and heavy duty grant program is not going to be applicable to light duty vehicles. Um, so we'll show you a little bit more about, you know, what what's offered in the program, what deadlines are upcoming, and then the actual total cost of ownership assumptions that were applied in your analysis are on the far right side. And that brings us to the EV model comparison section, which, like I said earlier, you know, that the lowest total cost of ownership option might not be the best option for you. Um, so this shows you additional options. Um, this is a simple comparison across a single model type or yeah, vehicle type. And so it doesn't include any uh, charging infrastructure costs or apply any uh, potential grants or incentives. Uh, but um, we do include that detail in a little sample financial analysis that we'll show you in a moment. But what this is most useful for is to compare the vehicles with infrastructure aside, because in general, we know, you know, um, we know how much time or, or what charger, you know, might be needed for each vehicle. So if you go into your analysis and you say, okay, that Chevy Bolt wasn't the best option for me. Let me compare it with, with the rest here. It's not gonna change the charger recommendation. It's just gonna change you know, the, the vehicle cost. So we'll do that for every vehicle type that's in your fleet, showing you know, battery electric, plug-in hybrid, and, and the internal combustion engine option. So I'm just gonna scroll past this area. <clears throat> And this is the sample financial analysis. So, uh, you know, the, the gasoline item is going to be based on an average, again, from the energy and um, I'm sorry, the Energy Information Administration's data. Uh, you know, they'll they'll give us the average cost of a gasoline engine vehicle in America, and then we can compare that with the actual costs of a specific plug-in hybrid and a specific battery electric vehicle for SUVs in this scenario. Clearly, the electric options have higher capital costs and they have charging infrastructure costs as well in this situation, but we're also getting significant amount of incentives. And so what that does is it brings both the plug-in hybrid and the battery electric vehicle options to actually have a lower 15-year total cost of ownership. And if you look at the um, you know, annual operational and maintenance costs, those are also clearly lower for especially the battery electric option because plug-in hybrids still have a combustion engine, so you're still maintaining that. But you do get some of the benefits in terms of, you know, fuel costs uh, with the, with the plug-in hybrid. And really, that has to do with how you drive it. Uh, you know, if you have plug-in hybrids and you're driving them around town, short mileage every time, um, you're probably going to save a lot more money <clears throat> than, you know, someone who would maybe take it on a long drive every day. You might go outside of your electric range and end up burning more fuel. So keep in mind, plug-in hybrids, um, you know, are, are best driven locally because you know you get a lot of uh, use of electricity, but they're still not insignificant in their you know use and application in long distance. 
uh, they are good for um, you know having more torque. Um, they some of them do have abilities to plow, uh, which is significant for for many communities. Um, so we do recommend uh, you know that folks who are looking to plow with electric vehicles uh, look into XL fleet plug-in hybrid conversions. You know they'll take. Um, you know, a light duty pickup like a Ford F-150 or a medium duty pickup like a Ford F-350 <clears throat> and they'll add an electric unit. Uh, and so you'll have more torque, you'll have better range, better gas mileage, but uh, you're not going to sacrifice anything uh, that wasn't already included in the manufacturer's specifications. Um, so those medium duty plug-in hybrids can still plow. And then, so we'll, we'll show you just a little more financial comparison uh, for that one SUV in this section, but, but I'll, I'll skip that for now and we'll go to this environmental impact analysis. You know, again, across the life of all these vehicles, so 24 years, you'll see obviously there's a significant savings here. Um, you know, we're looking at uh, what 3,500 metric tons, uh, say, yeah, 3,567 metric tons uh, over 24 years. Um, very significant NOx emission reductions, which, um, you know, that is the most important thing when you're focusing on individual uh, human health. Um, so, you know, not to be overlooked. Um, and, you know, equivalent to, to over 58,000 tree seedlings grown, which is, is certainly a significant number. Um, apologies for the uh, incorrect heading here. Not sure how that slipped by us. This is not next steps. This is non-road equipment. Um, so we did take a look at your, your non-road equipment <clears throat> here. And so it looks like we're recommending seven ATVs, 15 mowers, and one forklift. And we'll quantify the financial savings across uh, you know, all those conversions there, as well as the greenhouse gas emissions. Um, there is some detail here you know, about different brands and makes and models. We're not recommending specific makes and models for the non-road equipment. Um, you know, mostly because there's differences in how your fleet will use them. Uh, and so one of these may be much better for your fleet than they will be for a different fleet. Um, so we recommend, you know, taking a look at the offerings from these manufacturers. Um, the, the biggest barrier here is going to be runtime. Uh, so, you know, swappable batteries is very advantageous to consider for non-road equipment. Um, but, you know, there are options here. Uh, they are quiet, you know, they require less maintenance, you know, they don't produce site emissions. Uh, they really improve the health of the workers who are using it. Uh, that's the main thing. Um, and then they also, of course, improve the, the health and the air quality of the community. Um, you know, one, one gas powered mower uh, can use much more gasoline than a light duty pickup in a year. Uh, so they, they also don't have the same um, emissions control on their exhaust systems. Um, so they are significantly more damaging to the environment than uh, on-road vehicles can be. Uh, so definitely consider electrifying your off-road vehicles wherever possible. And um, I believe that is about it for the actual report results. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, this is sort of a, a basic next step roadmap. Um, so, you know, this is we are taking part in the next step, which is meeting with us and, and asking any questions. So I encourage uh, questions to be asked here. Um, you know, present this information to your stakeholders. Seems like many of the key stakeholders are on the call here today. There may be others in your community. So we recommend sharing this. Um, and then, you know, working with consumers energy the whole way from now until uh, actually deploying your, your first electric vehicles, uh, to, you know, to, to identify the right charging station vendors um, to plan for the, the sufficient power to be delivered to your sites um, and to make sure that everything's ready uh, at the right time um, and you know that you can plan for the future. Uh, so if you're you know putting in a few vehicles in year one, but you know there's more vehicles coming in year four, you want to make sure that you can plan for all of those vehicles if you're going to make any site upgrades. So I will stop there and um, open the floor for questions or for anyone else who may want to jump in and, and make any additions. Do you guys have a master vendor that you utilize for charging infrastructure installations? We do not. Steve, is there a vendor that, that your uh, that Consumers Energy 
typically has success with or, or may rely on. <clears throat> we generally do have actually some... go ahead. We do. We do. We got three vendors. We got three approved vendors that we go through Blink and LX and ChargePoint for your charging station. So um, if you need an electrician, we can help you out with that as well. We can help you go out to quote with those vendors. Um, they usually been doing really good work. Plus they answer the questions for a lot of customers in regards so we can get their charging data that we're gonna, that we require in the program. So they have a network that does that. So we don't really have to deal with uh, another um, way of going around that. So yeah, that's what we got in the program at this time. And I assume using somebody like ChargePoint, you guys have it set up so that they can, you know, turn off their sort of national system and be a more localized like RFID type um, swipe to, to get access. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have it set up like that on our network. I don't fully know the ins and outs of that. I'm just high level with it, but then yeah. we get into those details to make sure everything is safe and secure. But if it's it's not like if we decide to go with the charge point down the road, we don't have to just install their system and then utilize their national rate system. I mean, there's a we can set it up for our needs. Correct. Correct. And we would partner through this whole process because there's a piece of this internally where we will get our project coordinators involved in our engineering team to validate that when your EV gets there, that we have everything up to uh, par especially from your utility asset to the meter, because we will cover that cost if you needed an upgrade to put that charger in the ground in our program. So we want to make sure everything is a uh, lock key and step together. Of that installation cost, what all is recoverable under this program? I mean, if we've got to run a 220 line out to the parking lot somewhere, that's if it's, if it's from our utility asset to the meter, we cover that whole car, okay. everything. So that could be a $50,000 cost we would cover. Yeah. That's why we send our project coordinators out to validate if we need to cover that cost. And you still get charger rebates, um, $5,000 for a level two charger. Um, and you know, for most people, they're not doing DCFCs because they don't have a bus type transit. So uh, we got a lot of those in our program too. A lot of those rebates are spoken for for school districts that we're finding. But um, yeah, that five thousand dollar rebate for level twos are out there. And when it comes to those level twos, you can get up to limit of ten per site. So uh, yeah, based on what you guys want to set up, we understand that this may not happen this year. It may not happen next year. But we just like to start the conversations now because I know people can go through different changes. We don't want you to think that you're out there by yourself. Steve, when you say there's a, going to be public charging stations or just for township? Say that one more time. Will the public, or the, I'm sorry, will the charging stations that you recommended be for public or just township vehicles? Um, we're talking about for township vehicles. So there are a number of ways to decrease the number of chargers that may be needed for installation. Um, also, there are ways to avoid installing a DC fast charger uh, because we are recommending two DC fast chargers. But as Steve said, many people don't install DC fast chargers. Uh, so the report does detail some ways that, that you can, or some strategies, um, you know, <clears throat> garaging EVs together, um, you know, alternating the duty cycles of the vehicles uh, so, so you can take advantage of multiple chargers. And then taking advantage of public, you know, um, public use chargers is, is another way to do things uh, to avoid some additional costs. But, you know, all our recommendations are assuming that you do not have any chargers installed already and that no no public uh, people are going to be using this charger. It's just for your fleet. Steve, when you say there's a cap of 10, do you mean for what uh, consumers would be willing to pay for? Yeah, for what consumers are willing to pay for. So for wherever your location is, where these chargers would go um, with you as a customer, you know, we look at that and we'd say, okay, they want to put, uh, I don't know if their recommendations were, hey, we want to put five, level two chargers and well our program will cover up to five thousand dollar rebate per dual port level twos and it's a limit of 10 per site a limit of 10 chargers per site so that could equal up to uh, fifty thousand dollars based on a person's site location where they would be putting uh, their fleet and housing everything 
and in terms of how we run how we run the electrical um can you just go through how these are typically structured in terms of running the conduit no i can't i i don't have that capability we would end up you'd end up talking to a, a project coordinator for that and our engineering we put in a request they'd end up coming out to the site having that full conversation with you walking it down with you validating and doing voltage calculations to make sure that uh, whatever you want to put in in the near future is also present for what you'd want to put in later in the future. But typically, if you're putting in a 220 volt charger, don't you need a separate line going from the panel for each charger? I can't speak on it because I don't have that background. Okay, I thought maybe you would. Okay. No, I probably I'm just wondering because that factors. We'll talk to some of our electricians who we've used in the past because it, you know, we don't want to keep unearthing the conduit and keep running more lines. So the logistics right. matter, if we're going to do like all the public safety carports, we might as well do them all at once if it's going to be, you know. Right, and that would be important for us to know because when I put that request in, uh, my engineer would end up looking at it from the same perspective you would, so that everybody would be aligned. Okay. What I was seeing on those, on the recommended vehicles that didn't, Unless I missed something, I didn't see a vehicle that was uh, duty size for a, a patrol a patrol vehicle. So I don't know, did I miss a recommendation somewhere of a, of a vehicle the size of a medium SUV with the range and 12 hour time span? Or police vehicles? <clears throat> Let's see. Um, well, there, there's only five police electric vehicles that are currently you know, approved for pursuit. Uh, they are, that are pursuit rated. Um, so I believe the um, <clears throat> the SUV that we were recommending for police is the Chevy Bolt EUV. So it's the SUV version of the Bolt. It's you know significantly larger than the the sedan sort of hatchback version, but uh, you know still would be considered a small SUV. Um, so <clears throat> the only other the only other SUV that's that's pursuit rated, I believe, is a is a Tesla Model Y which still is a medium uh, size SUV. So, uh, you know, other than those two options, unfortunately there, there are no uh, police. Oh, I'm sorry. The Mustang Mach-E is another one. Um, that's still medium sized, you know, um, but not maybe not the medium that, that you're speaking of as it's kind of hard to identify size sometimes, but um, so between the Bolt EUV that the Tesla Model Y and the Mustang Mach-E those are the three, you know, medium-ish sized electric vehicles, but there are no full-sized electric vehicles or plug-in hybrids at the moment that are pursuit rated. And John, I don't think the Explorer, to that extent, I don't think the Explorers that we currently use are considered to be a full-size SUV. Um, but one of the things, one of the hurdles that we come across is we're not just law enforcement, we also run medical first responder equipment. And so as we stand now in our existing explorers, we are loaded to the gills with equipment. I mean, we, we struggle to find room for equipment, let alone prisoners. And uh, that's, that's my one concern is the amount of equipment that we have to carry with us. We're not a traditional law enforcement agency when it comes to the sheer volume of stuff we've got in our cars. Absolutely, yeah, I appreciate that insight. It's really helpful for us to hear, you know, how, practical or, or impractical our recommendations may be ultimately for, for police. Um, so, you know, I, I hear you. I, I wish that I had a better answer for you uh, in terms of, you know, real options right now. Uh, but, you know, we'll, we'll all stay posted for uh, a full size electric vehicle sometime soon. It seems like many manufacturers, many American manufacturers, you know, are working on these. Um, we do have the, um, the Hummer EV, uh, SUV coming soon, which, you know, borders medium duty. Uh, it's, it's almost 10,000 pounds. Um, and there are, there are more coming. So, you know, sit tight and, and hopefully, you know, we can recommend some full-sized, plenty of storage capacity, uh, ideally all-wheel drive, you know, electric SUVs soon. And Jonathan, what does the market look like for fire and ambulance? Yeah, fire and ambulance is also tricky. Um, we are not making recommendations for fire or ambulance at this time. It doesn't mean there aren't options. Um, there, there are there, some options. Yeah, there's two manufacturers that build fire engines. 
Uh, they're about $1.3 million each. They're still in the early stage. Uh, Madison Fire Department and LA are testing them, and they've actually bought some, um, but they're $1.3 million. Um, ambulances I've not checked on. Yeah, um, there's also some happening in, in Arizona. Mesa, Arizona is, is piloting one as well. Um, you, you really need like a very special funding source for that. Um, usually federal is gonna, are going to be the people that, that have that kind of money. Um, in terms of, you know, full size fire, it, it's going to be a while until those are real capable uh, and affordable. <clears throat> in terms of um, medium duty chassis where you can, you know, upfit something that might work for you. Um, those are more available. Uh, and again, you know, I, I point you towards the uh, retrofits, uh, the XL fleet retrofits, Lightning e-motors, um, you know, those companies out there that are taking, you know, a Ford F550 platform and ripping out the internal combustion engine and, and putting in a battery electric vehicle uh, motor and, and battery, um, you know, you'll see uh, the ability to carry the weight that the OEM you know, claims, um, you'll, you'll see longer range, uh, you'll see the ability to, you know, run more equipment like lights and other things, um, plow, plow snow, all those things. So plug-in hybrids um, and retrofits are, are the best option right now for like a, an emergency response medium duty type vehicle. So Jonathan, knowing that, <clears throat> knowing that the EV vehicle um, manufacturing is probably going to be, you know, what what determines our timeline for converting our motor pool. Uh, how much turnover are you seeing in the market for the charging stations? Like, when do they become obsolete? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Um, this is something that I am working on actively to incorporate into our analysis, but we're not currently uh, incorporating. Um, so, you know, I, I talked with someone, um, Justin, who was our tech talk that we had the other day, the charging company? Um, that was ChargePoint. ChargePoint. Okay, ChargePoint. Uh, it would, they, they said something like seven to 10 years is the lifespan of a level two charger. Um, so they're just starting to hit the lifespan right now, the first you know, batch of, of level two chargers that were installed for many fleets. Um, technology is improving significantly and rapidly. So, you know, we're seeing more turnover right now. Um, so, you know, we can't really say uh, exactly how long chargers that are being installed in 2022 are going to last. <clears throat> but, you know, from ChargePoint last week, you know, uh, we heard that it's it's seven to 10 years lifespan right now. You should consider uh, replacing your charger. Is it heavier use or lighter use that's causing the replacement sooner? That's a good question. I, I don't know the answer to that, but that's that a good was question. A call because I have no idea. So yeah, I I don't know. Okay, so we're probably not looking at charging stations other than maybe a public station, one or you know one to three stations for public and staff use, um, in the immediate future. Okay, I could see. Um, our five administrative vehicles and the police department converting to electric use vehicles because the majority of that mileage is around town and a short distance on occasion we'll do a, a Grand Rapids Detroit Metro but very rarely the, the higher percentage of that is um, just around town short trip. What's the age of those vehicles chief? Well, uh, Two years old one we just got replaced came in in 2022 we have one that's going to need replacing we have a 2009 ford escape a 2021 escape a 2022 escape and a 2021 ford ranger um, and then a 2022 ford explorer And they, they have a typical lifespan of five years, but there's also the theory that if we were to sell them in the three-year range, we would get almost as much money as what we've paid for them because the mileage level is not as high as uh, consumer use would be. And so in theory, you can run them the 36 months that they have warranty coverage and, and sell them for what the government purchase price was while still under warranty without ever changing the tires. So 
So Chief, I'll just add, um, you know, you asked about which ones were were recommended for the police department. And, uh, you know, just reviewing it again, it looks like we're actually not recommending pursuit rated vehicles for the police department. Uh, we are recommending non-pursuit rated vehicles for the admin vehicles. Um, and then it looks like we're recommending the F-150 Lightning to replace that Ranger um, and two electric motorcycles, which are my little uh, passion. So if you have any questions about that, let me know. I'd be happy to give you all the motorcycle options. <laughs> well, we're, and we're ready to replace those anytime, uh, Mr. Offsmer. So if you want to slide that in the budget, we'd be happy to take two electric motorcycles. Thanks. <laughs> Sounds good, Chief. Put one in for me, too, if you wouldn't mind. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Other questions, Rob, you have any questions? One, one of our challenges was oh. uh, we, we did some electric mowers a few years ago, and I'm not sure they have replacement batteries, but you mentioned something about choosing choosing options that can easily, with batteries, it can be easily replaced. Um, maybe Bob, you, or Rob, maybe you can articulate that better than I did. Uh I don't really know much about them. They don't use them much, so nobody, nobody. They're not user friendly. Uh, I mean, MSU bought electric mowers, the same electric mowers, the same time we did, and within a year they were done with them. They're they're just not user friendly. What they've got out on the market. So, what was the brand of them? Do you remember the Green Machine? Green or Machines. Yeah, Green Machine. It's the same product that uh, MSU purchased and MSU ended up selling theirs. Rob and I have already looked at selling ours because our crews aren't using them. Do you have any experience, uh, Jonathan, or adjusting yeah, about uh, <clears throat> those, those particular ones or, or recent improvements? My first question would be, you know, what is, what are the age of the electric mowers in your fleet and in, and in MSU's fleet? Um, and then, you know, my second assumption would be that, assuming it's a couple of years old, there have been significant improvements, uh, many more offerings from different brands. Uh, the ones that we recommend, you know, to, to look at uh, in our report here are um, WeBang E-Rider is one name, uh, Ryobi Zero Turn Rider and the Cub Cadet Ultima. Um, also worth looking at Turf One and uh, Arians. Uh, so those are all on page 27 of the report. Um, I mean, I, I'm actually working on a little you know, side project for my mom who is uh, worried about our landscaping and crew at home and wants to you know, have, convince them to electrify. And unfortunately, uh, I don't really have convincing evidence right now. Uh, for landscaping companies to electrify because they, they have such long run times. Um, you know, they don't have necessarily like a battery unit on their truck where they can charge these um, and buying batteries for swapping is more expensive. Um, it is a legitimate option. Many of these brands now have swappable battery options, uh, but you know, the cost of most of them are comparable um, it's really the, the runtime that's that's concerning uh, landscaping crews. Most are about, I think, four hours or even less runtime. Oh, yeah, that's, Thank you. That's, that's the projected runtime for the green machines. Now, whether or not they actually realize that right. is another story, and that depends on the operator and conditions, mm -hmm. how cold it was in the garage, so how Absolutely. cold it was outside. 2018 Mean Green Chaos 60s. That's what they were. Okay. So four years. I mean, there's definitely been improvements. Uh, you know, if you look at a four-year-old electric vehicle, just a, you know, a car, significant improvements have happened since then. Um, you know, Apple CarPlay wasn't really even uh, available until 2018. So consider that. Thank you. And the next... Well, Roy, the next time we have um, a meeting on this, we should probably bring in uh, both of our mechanics. So they're also going to be heavily impacted by this decision as well. Other Josh, questions? Who, who do you guys see rolling this out that it's working well? In terms of, sorry, in terms, have, uh, in terms sorry, of fleet electrification in general, who's, who's doing a good job? 
yeah, uh, so MSU we, is right now. Yep. That we're seeing MSU, they're doing a they're doing a great job with it. Um, uh, they're 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 big on it. So is Western Michigan. They're doing a really good job with it. Um, I think a lot of customers from my approach that I've seen uh, dealing with them um, have been just starting small and just planning planning for the future. A lot of the same questions you guys are asking or uh, similar um, for your location and what you're looking at. And um, I think the biggest thing they dealt with was just, you know, what vehicles do we want to go for at this time? Um, and then which vehicles are available because so many have been on back order due to COVID. But uh, yeah, there are customers who are moving forward. Some of them are taking small steps. They'll say, hey, we'll start small here, which is perfectly fine. Um, and our program is require at some point the customer at least obtains one EV vehicle. So um, yeah, and this is a pilot program to 2024. So this is set up just for customers like yourself uh, to electrify. So we've been seeing some success. I'll add on to that. This might be obvious, but just for the sake of saying it, um, you know, we are moving into a period of time where walking into a dealership and picking out 10 vehicles that you want is no longer an option. Um, so, you know, we need to be thinking six months to even 12 months for normal vehicles in advance. Specialty vehicles, you want to plan more than 12 months in advance. Sounds good. Well, we really appreciate your your time here, everybody um, tuning in. And there may be some more questions that come up. Um, should we direct those to you, Stephen? And then uh, first, yeah, you can direct them to me. At the same time, I'm going to put down in about a month to 45 days from today. We wanted to bring everyone back up to speed. Um, I'll be meeting with you to follow up again. Uh, we could talk about next steps towards electrification, uh, but we at least wanted to get the report back out there, um, give people a chance to ask some questions. You guys can ponder on it, sit on it, talk, to it about, talk about it amongst yourselves. And we'll meet again to say, hey, what are you guys looking towards now? Before that time period, if you do decide something, just shoot me an email, let me know, and we'll partner in that and uh, make sure that we you know, can follow the steps together in this partnership. So we're just excited to have you guys on board, seriously. What's the best way to stay uh, on the cutting edge of the technology? Do you have any suggestions for, for us on that? Mm, that I, might be an ICF answer. I mean, I would just say, uh, you know, vehicles are advancing really quickly right now. So lease and not own is probably a good idea. Um, you know, lease your EVs, turn them over quickly. And just try to, you know, be procuring the the best vehicles whenever you can. You know, range and ability to charge are two things that are really important to fleets and are rapidly improving. Anything else, um, Dan or Rob, or anybody else? Parting comments. Have <clears throat> anything? Great. Thanks so much, you guys. Um, and then if I think we have your latest reports, um, but if um, <clears throat> just to be sure if um, maybe Stephen forwards the latest one or Jonathan, the latest one over, um, I'll redistribute that. And uh, of course, we'll have this recording if you want to, uh, to tune back into it and repeat anything that they've said. Thanks. Uh -oh. I'll also just point you towards the recommendation file, which is the Excel supplement. And that'll be a one for one, you know, existing vehicle and recommended vehicle. So you can take a look at all the high level details from the report are a little more lo low level uh, on the Excel supplement. More individual, that is. So, Great. Thank you all. Thank, thanks, everybody. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. All right. Take care.